from VQR and the Center for Media and Citizenship, this is Episode 3 of Circle of Willis, where I discuss the science and politics of sexual identity with Lisa Diamond of the University of Utah. And we'll also hear about Lisa's personal story, how she came to identify as a, as a feminist, as a lesbian, and as a scientist, and how all of those identities have really converged on a profound body of work. Have a listen. Hey everyone, it's Jim Cohn. This is my podcast. It's called Circle of Willis. Uh, you're not going to believe this, but this episode features Lisa Diamond, professor of psychology and gender studies at the University of Utah. And, and we are going to talk about everything from the science and politics of sexual identity to Lisa's personal experience coming to identify as a lesbian. How about that? Uh, I feel really lucky to have had the opportunity to talk to Lisa because, well, because, you know, Lisa is both an excellent conversation partner and an internationally recognized pioneer in the scientific study of sexual identity development. And, uh, and that's not too easy to pull off, that combination. Now, Lisa, Lisa is sort of fearless. I don't know if she'd cop to that, but it's true. For example, uh, one of the things, uh, one, of the, one of the many things to admire about Lisa is that she sees no contradiction in having both a, a kind of a strong scientific and a strong political point of view. Certainly, uh, certainly on questions of sexual identity and bonding, but on a, on a number of other issues as well. And uh, and she she in fact she describes herself as a feminist scientist, which is not to say that her her science is uniquely feminist in some way, but rather to sort of just assert that she's both a feminist and a scientist. And proudly so, sometimes controversially so. I mean, I mean, she is she's absolutely willing to let politics inform her scientific point of view, but she is equally willing to let science sort of update and inform her politics. Now, in 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 our conversation, we talk a lot about the sample of women, this this sample that she studied for years, for decades now. And, uh, and how her pursuit of the sample grew out of a, a social commitment to bring sexual identity development into the sort of scientific light. But we also discuss how the, the systematic study of this sample caused her to almost completely rethink her understanding of same-sex sexuality. And I, I, guess, I guess now is a good time to point out that if, if you're interested in a, a sort of a deeper dive into this research, you should check out her award-winning 2009 book, entitled Sexual Fluidity, Understanding Women's Love and Desire, uh, a link to which you can, you can find at circleofwillispodcast.com. And I guess, I guess while I'm at that, while I'm at it here, uh, you, can, you can also find a link there to a truly, really a truly seminal paper that Lisa wrote for, for Psychological Review uh, on the differences between romantic love and sexual attraction in the determination of sexual orientation. It's an, uh, it's an amazing Amazing piece of work, and and really, really pretty accessible, even for for non specialists. I I think you should read it. But uh, now I I've I've already said that Lisa spends a lot of time discussing her own sort of emerging identity as a lesbian. Uh, but but in listening to the conversation again, as as I did recently, just the, actually just this morning, um, it struck me that. That Lisa's is really the story of of multiple emerging identities. Uh, for for example, you know it's all it's also about the the development of her political identity as a feminist, and and about the development of her professional identity as a, as a scientist. And and what's fascinating uh, to me about her story is is how uh, as each of these identities develops, the they slowly sort of intertwine over time to kind of converge 
on her work as one of our really one of our most important psychological scientists. I think, you know, I think I think her story is is instructive, you know. The the way that we develop really can inform our interests. You know, the the questions we ask. And it and it's probably true that we should draw from or at, or at the very least sort of respect the sources of information and, and identity that constitute who we are as we're as we're developing our, our professional lives. You know, Lisa's story really illustrates for me how the, the convergence of personal and professional interests can be powerfully rewarding, not only for her, but, you know, owing to the body of knowledge she's contributed, really, for all of us. And at any rate, uh, I'm deeply, deeply grateful that, that Lisa took the time with me to record this conversation. You know, throughout, she's, she's really, she's thoughtful, she's funny, she's wise, and above all, I would say extremely generous in, in her level of self-disclosure. Now, that kind of generosity is, is really, it's priceless. And, and I'm, I'm so glad to have captured just a little bit of it uh, to share with you here. So uh, that said, people of the world, struggling students, colleagues, friends, uh, perplexed adolescents everywhere, here's, here's Lisa Diamond. Most low brow, you know, you can you can do yeah, it just from your bedroom. Brow. That's the that's what I'm shooting. And well, then well, you can get you know, the a huge stuff. number of followers, and then it just sort of takes it just off. Does its own thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I asked you to come in and talk to me so I can get a huge number of followers. There you go. Yeah, that'll work. See? Yeah, it should. Mm -hmm. You're kind of famous. You have a Wikipedia entry. What? Did you know that? No. Yeah, I found it. I don't have a Wikipedia entry. I, that has How do got, you do that? I, I had no idea. Yeah, now I I'm found sort of it. Obsessed. Now yeah, I feel like don't I'm, look at it yet because I don't want to bias you. Mm -mm. I don't know if it's true or I'm not. Afraid. I don't see if you'll I'm get afraid of upset. what's on there. It said, I, I, it said you're a feminist. Is that I am a you? feminist, okay, damn good. it. See, that's excellent. It's, it's accurate. It's accurate. <laughs> what, okay, so I guess when I think of you, I think of feminism i also think of sexual identity and you've sort of blown my mind with that because i i really Just doing my job well you know i didn't i never i well part of part of part of it is that i come from a very working class background good people right not bad people but definitely sexist people definitely homophobic well, so both people my parents. i mean my parents came from my, my mom is from a very small town in Florida and still yeah. has a lot of latent She's sexism nervous. and racism. And my sure. dad, you know, was raised, you know, very poor and working classes. His father died when he was 16. So his yeah. mom was... So they both came from um, not explicitly conservative, but kind of traditional. And I think especially my mom from the South. I mean, her yeah. when we visit her relatives... It's like a different world. It's like, you know, uh, a much more segregated world. Yeah. And that's always a, a bit of a shock. Did she, but did she, so, but did she go to college and think, I can't remember. She did go to college. She is interesting. She has a, a, a background that I didn't know a lot about until I started doing interviews with her. And I was, it sort of blew my mind because I didn't know that much about her background. And, you know, she was in this really kind of small town where education for girls was not a big thing. Right. Um, and she, at some point she decided that she really wanted to get out of Lakeland and go Lakeland. to college, but there was no money. Her piano teacher, because my mom was a pianist and she, and she ended up becoming a piano teacher. Her piano teacher um, found a bunch of scholarships for her to apply to and and sent my mom on these, you know, made tapes of her playing piano. And she got a scholarship to pay for the first year. Uh, but then she showed up to, at, at Wesleyan, Georgia. Uh -huh. uh, and and her mom was not in favor of it. She was like, this is crazy. We don't have enough money for you to, you know, this is, but, you know, just trying to get through the first year. And she ended up being something like $200 short to 200. register. And her piano teacher 
took a collection from other families in the community. In Lakeland. Yeah, to support my mom. Lakeland, Florida. Lakeland, Florida. Wow. And, and she my went, mom. And that's, that's in Georgia. The Wesleyan in Georgia is in Atlanta? No. No, where is it? I don't remember exactly. I don't even I don't even I know. I visited it, it once, but really? it's small. It's small it's town. It's small. Like some, something like Athens, that kind of small? Yeah. Or? And I remember at one point, you know, as, because Lakeland, again, is a, is a kind of, in, I remember saying to my mother at some point, I don't know how you came out of that Lakeland, town. Lakeland, Florida. Right. How did you, you know, how did you know to, you know, how, how did you not end up there? And mom looked at me and she said, I was not going to stay. <laughs> so she, she wanted out. She wanted, she out. wanted out. And she got Hell out and like, gained no so more much of this. respect for her because... Yeah. Because that's she, that's tricky. She became a what, really I mean, when, when was that? That was like the mid '60s. Let's see. She and my dad got married '64, uh, so I think she got out around. She was born in '43. Um, '43. So she got out when she was 18. Yeah. But she didn't finish college because she met my dad during the summer. <sighs> right. Working as a waitress in New Jersey. Wait, well, how, what, well, I don't know. That's a lot of story there going Well, she from, just, you know, from one of her roommates, she was like, I need to make money over the summer or else I can't keep going to college. And I need college. to go to New Jersey to and, make money? Well, that this was little, where a lot of the, the Catskills, like, there were a lot of these sort of summer clubs uh-huh. for the, the, the New York So she got set. a job. She in got the, a job yeah. as a waitress, and, um, and that's where she met my dad at the New Jersey Shore during the summer. Um, and they knew each other for three months. And he proposed, and so That's, she left they college. They did that then. I know. They did, people did that then. They did that then. And they that kind of shocked me. And her mom totally disapproved and wouldn't go to the wedding. Of course she did. Wouldn't go to the wedding. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. Three months. Yeah. And your dad was going to med school? Or? Yeah. 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 <sighs> and he had also sort of pulled himself up by his bootstraps to... He was you know, from New Jersey? He was from, well, he, was in, he spent his childhood in Washington Heights in New York. New York. And then they so moved to on, New Jersey. Sort of on the northern part yeah. of the Manhattan. Uh, and, then, uh, and then went to Rutgers uh-huh. uh, for undergrad. Yeah. And then in Newark? Went to, pardon? In Newark? Yeah. 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 So they both had these really hard scrabble um, backgrounds and we're both really uh and so then they end up in los angeles los angeles you know which is like for for you know someone uh-huh. raised in the winters uh-huh. of new york for yeah. my dad it was like you know it did he, this it, sounds good which it, it does i bet i mean he you're a physician in the in the early 70s warm, in los angeles warm weather warm warm weather. It's warm and you know it's he went sunny to all the time cedar sinai medical center which would at that time was really becoming like a rising star for cardiovascular medicine, which was what, you know, he ended yeah. up doing. So it was one of those, uh, you know, right place, right time. And that's where things. you spring forth out of the void. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Los Angeles. So you're an L.A. LA girl. I was born in L.A. Yeah, yeah, and raised. And raised. And, and it, how did it affect you? Um, I really was not crazy about L.A., um, uh, so I don't know how it affected me. I, I, and it's funny because as I got older and especially when I went to college in Chicago, people yeah. would say to me, you don't seem like you're from LA. You seem like an East coast person. And everyone has always well, told me that I seem like I'm from New York. Yeah. Um, you do I, have a New Yorky kind of, yeah, kind of and vibe. I don't, you know, I don't, who knows, you know, but what you know, LA, uh, you know, LA can have a similar kind of vibe. It seems to me sometimes it depends on what part I mean, L.A. is very diverse. Yeah. But there, there are parts of L.A. that have that sort of arty, you know, yeah. you know, cultural and interest. And I did a lot of theater. I mean, because it's L.A. Yeah. Like, I was into acting at a very young age. And I tried to do it, you know, because the, the bad thing about being raised in L.A., if you're into theater at all, is like, if you show any aptitude for anything theatrical then everyone's like oh well you should try and get an agent and start to do commercials and blah 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 blah, right, blah, blah. Right, and that's right. actually really hard to do if you really want to do that it's like a full-time job yeah. and so like i was going to an acting school where everybody else in my acting classes was like doing professional 
stuff. There was like people who ended up being like famous in my, uh, I think Stephen Dorff was like in Stephen one of my Dorf. classes. And he Wasn't ended he up, like a action guy or something? Yeah, he did some like big movie and I was like, oh my God. Um, <laughs> but that, like I was not, you know, I was never <laughs> successful at that. I never <laughs> managed to get an agent or do anything. And so I felt like, oh, yeah. I was just into doing plays, yeah. you know, and, but it was, it's hard in LA to, to, you know, just want to do that because everyone's trying to get you to yeah. like, do some toothpaste commercial and that <laughs> was not my thing. That wasn't your thing. What, did, what, what was your, I mean, did you, did you identify as a sort of feminist early on or was not it, until it was sort of high, later in high school? High school? Well, yeah. high school sort of like, I mean, I think about if, if you're going to get that way, it's not going to be before high school. You know, really. Betty Friedan, because I went to an all girls high school. Is that how you pronounce it? Friedan? Yeah. I thought it was Frieden for no, some reason. All my whole life. I've just, and my mind is blown all of a sudden. She came to talk at my high school, I think when I was in like ninth grade, maybe? Ninth? I ninth? Didn't even, I didn't even know who she was. Betty Friedan goes goes to your high school? Yeah. In the ninth grade? Uh, when I was in the ninth grade. And, you know, what? she was That's an old curmudgeon, great you know, at that high point. School. But it was Jesus. kind of controversial because, um, you know, this was an all girls school. It was, you know, there were a lot of sort of society girls there, oh, and a lot of them oh, thought that school, feminism right. was just like not for them. So it was very controversial, and I remember hearing people debate, you know, like whether it was a good idea that Betty Friedan was coming, and I was like, I don't even know. Betty this is what, Friedan like is. 1985? This would have been, yeah, I guess 1985. Yeah. And, uh, and she just said, you know, what? This is what feminism is. If you think that you should be able to make your own decision about whether you want a job or whether you have a family or whether you do both. If you just think that that should be your own decision to make. And that seemed pretty welcome obvious to feminism. To you. Yeah. And I was like, Oh my God, really? You know, and <laughs> why? Because you didn't, you hadn't entertained that. Oh, you know, had... One of the things that I thought, I remember when I, when I first, I remember first learning about feminism. And one of the things that I think that, that, struck me when I was first experiencing that was I hadn't thought about the fact that that those things weren't true mm. until someone was telling me that that ought to be true yeah like it didn't I mean I, I was sort of I mean not that I didn't see sexism yeah. happening yeah. but I hadn't really reflected upon it yeah I don't have a clear memory of what I thought before that um I just hadn't, you know, I think maybe it was just, again, right person, right time. My yeah. brain was sort of ready for it. Yep. And my closest friends, you know, my, my very best friend who I've known since I was five wow. uh, is uh, a woman named Janice Kim. And she was the child, of, she was a Korean child of immigrants. You know, uh -huh. her parents basically came over here, uh, had her, um, and she didn't speak any English. And that she went through kindergarten twice just to learn English uh, oh, and man. then we met you know in elementary school and she was always really influenced because she, because she knew from a very early age and again it was a sort of classic Korean immigrant experience of I need to do, succeed for my parents because I'm going to yeah. support them she was an only child she's going to make the change so she even she's at that age she vanguard. was like thinking about her future and thinking about you know career and so because she was so career focused, she was like that, you know, that was an amazing speech. That is awesome. Like feminism is awesome. And so she sort of helped to articulate for me, you know, like, yeah. So a part of it was hearing Betty Friedan. Part of it was having a group of friends that were like, well, hell yeah. Yeah. You know, h hello. Um, and you were in an all girls for private school? Yeah. Boarding school? Yeah. No, not boarding no, no, school. Not boarding school. Private school. school. Private school. Um, so that, that probably helped a bit too. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was great because there wasn't, you know, all this attention on uh, how you looked, you know, yeah. there were, we had uniforms, right? you know, you just showed up for class wearing your uniform with your hair all crazy. And <laughs> it wasn't this, you know, when I, when I That's see a uh, television series where you see people at high school and there's like, it's basically a meat market, yeah. you know, and it wasn't like that but, at all. So, so you went on, you went to the University of Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. For undergrad? Mm -hmm. You must have been a really good student. I was a very good student. Holy crap. But my dad was really disappointed that I didn't want to go to, you know, Harvard or Yale or Princeton. Really? And because Yeah, because, you know, he had in his Jesus. mind, I think he was really proud of me, but he had a certain, 
you know, I think, I think, uh, you know, University of Chicago is sort of lower on the radar. And so yeah. I, you don't I think about it. It's, it's, not, it's, yeah. not as, it's not a, as much a part of the popular, com- but you know, they take that as a, as a badge of honor. Exactly. Right? exactly. It's where, it's where fun goes to die. Exactly. Right. That's the, that's uh, the slogan. And that was, you know, because I was not like a social, you know, kind of kid. So, um, but I think as once I was there, um, he, you know, I think he, he understood the reputation. Oh of my God. It's an incredible probably. reputation. It's an amazing. Well, I mean, I think I've, I've, it ha- in some ways it has more of a reputation as a place for graduate study than undergrad. Yeah. I think and that's probably that time, true. And at that time, the ratio of graduate students, there were two graduate students for every undergrad student. So oh my God. there were a lot of graduate students. So there. that you gave you a lot of ex- uh, exposure to graduate school as well. Probably somewhat, although, you know, it was always like a big mystery. Well, but the thing was funny, you know, cause I did a lot of theater and I did a lot of music and I was always meeting, first or second year graduate students Uh because as we all know after the first or second year you're really working hard so you just kind of disappear yeah and so i was like (laughs) how long does graduate school take because the only graduate students i've ever met it takes two years i'm like they just they disappear it's like (laughs) poof they're gone you know i i met the first years and the second years and then it's like they go underground well so what'd you do at university of chicago did you were you a psych major i i was a psych major Okay. Sort of by accident. By accident? Because yeah, me um, too, actually. I, I, I had a very, my, my roommate uh, was my very best friend, and also, like, I was completely in love with her. Um, uh, and how'd that go? We were, well, it never turned Nothing out happened. into anything, but, like, you know, if it wasn't for her, but I, you, I would never. But by, by this time, are you fully identifying as a no lesbian way. person? At that point, I just, I view, the way I dealt with my sexuality in high school was I believed that I was just not a sexual person and that and I, I apparently my friend i've forgotten this i announced to my friends in 10th grade that i was never planning to get married or have any relationships wow and they were like um oh okay all right um but then i did <laughs> yeah they're like what what what's the content why does this come up? i don't even remember but at around i think around my junior year i'd gotten involved with some community theater uh-huh um and and one of the people who was involved in that group uh, ended up being my sort of first like major boyfriend, and it was perfect because he at, we started you know becoming close friends, and then and then he left to go to college in Berkeley, so it was perfect, right? Because we had no. He was gone, and so we <laughs> yeah, just yeah. wrote letters, and that yeah. was perfect for me. Great way to because have a... he was smart and funny, and and he was so smart, um, and you know, really intellectually challenging. But he was gone. He was gone. It was, Thank God. So that worked out, yeah. you know, pretty yeah. well. Yeah. And then he went to England, which was even better. So you went to England? No, he did. Oh, he did. Yeah, that's even further away. Even better. Yeah, can't right? can't fool around. And so I didn't really. Um, spend that much time trying to understand uh my sexuality at that point my i was but you were you were sort of in love with your roommate well that was in high school was before, you know so high school boyfriend was the one that was in england oh i see but i was also in love with uh my best friend in high school uh-huh. um who uh, it was like really intense emotional relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was able to sort of explain that to myself as like we're just you know no one understands. Right. Our, we have an intent. But you know that's also a thing. I uh, think. Of course. I mean, yeah, that's a. It totally is yeah, a thing. Yeah. Um, I remember you know it, there was this dicey period in junior year where um, we were all in in the AP English class and we were reading Mrs. Dalloway. Uh-huh. Which is like this famous, yeah, you know, lesbian important, novel. Very important. But book. we just interpreted it as like a version of our friendship, uh-huh, uh-huh. and we were like, "Oh my God, you know, this is this is the first novel that understands our relationship." Yeah. And the other people in the class are kind of like, "Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah." So I, I never, I never actually actively questioned my sexuality in high school. I had alternative explanations. I guess it was a scientific part of me for everything. Like I had this boyfriend. You know, you were smart. Was you were you gone. were really capable of rationalizing Absolutely. everything. That's that's it's clever people do Absolutely. that. Absolutely, they're very good and, at but, that. But and it wasn't until I went to college, and just immediately was just so struck by my roommate, 
And it was all also so obvious to me at that point that my feelings for her were erotic and uh-huh. not just yeah, emotional. Yeah, that takes it up a level. Yeah. That's a different level. You know, and so that's when sort of the shit hit the fan. Um, before then, I had, you know, I was not worried about it. I was just like, I'm just not a sexual person. I just don't enjoy sex with men and that's no big deal so w- you know? w- was your mind blown open or was it did it seem like this it was is, pretty blown this, open. Is un- this is this is understandable or this was inexorable or this is it, deeply it was part pretty of my blown identity open. Or what? and i remember um uh walking around the streets of of chicago thinking like what am i gonna do and i i could i can't, i couldn't even imagine telling my parents you yeah, know, I just, just remember gonna... thinking there is no solution to this. There's just no, there's no way that this is going to work. Um, and now, you know, now it's like my life is so completely fine that it's, it, I find it really instructive for me to remind myself of that because I think sometimes the queer community can be really unforgiving of folks who take a long time to come out. Is, is that true? Yeah, and so uh, I have to remember my really freaked out, you know, 18-year-old self. And I have to, like, consciously remember that feeling of fear. Well, it, it also reminds me of the, the It Gets Better campaign, mm-hmm, you know, that mm-hmm. whole thing that, that seemed like a very important message that, yeah. that, that time... You know, it's part of yeah. this, you know, that, yeah. that, that the time marches on and things mm-hmm. change over time. And it can be hard to see the, the, how things are improving mm-hmm. when you're in it. And also, I mean, the thing that I, I find frustrating now is that, you know, if you're living in a big urban center, things are great. But there's a lot of, you know, queer folks living in Lakeland and Nebraska. Yep, yep, yep. And, and I think the meat is like, oh, wow, it's it's cool to be gay now. And I'm like, no, it's not. Yeah. Not for some person, oh my God, you yeah. know, in rural Michigan, it's yeah. not. Yeah. Oh, but, I yeah, mean, the internet totally. has changed everything. I mean, I can't imagine, I probably would have come out so much earlier if the internet had existed. Yeah. You know, with it just, I remember walking to the areas where I, I knew what the gay newspaper in Chicago was and I would go and I would get it and I would bring it home and I would read it cover to cover and then I would rip it up into pieces and take it to a distant trash can to throw it away so that my roommates Do, just could not know. find out. Wow. Wow. How about that? Yeah. I mean, I remember, you know, going to high school in Spokane, Washington, which is a really conservative place, really, really very conservative. And then moving to Seattle and being and you know what what, what is happening the hell? and and but 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 my early explanation was that, uh, you know uh gay people are from big cities and and really it, it was only really sad. driven like, home when i grew I up in to... la like i could have actually had there's a huge gay community in yeah. la but i didn't know anything about it yeah, yeah yeah and also when i was growing up you didn't think about like gay as meaning lesbians you thought of gay as me being gay men yeah you know that that time in the 80s there wasn't as much visibility about women uh, as there was about men. So I just thought of like, you know, West Hollywood as gay men, yeah, not, right. not any women. Yeah, on your, on your mental map yeah. of the world. Yeah, well, I, and, 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 and it's important for all of us. You, you were saying that, you know, if the internet had existed then, that things might have unfolded differently. I think that's really true. People don't realize, even by the 80s and 90s, it's still pretty fraught. I mean, I, yeah. I remember going to Seattle and trying to find a roommate and I found a roommate, nice guy. We're talking about, and I learned he was gay. And I said, yeah, I'm not going to be a roommate. This was me. I'm a nice guy. I'm a nice guy that wanted to do the right thing. But, but I, I, it, fa- when, I mean, when I was, one of the things that I have like such deep shame about is when I fell in with the community theater crowd, when I was around in 10th grade, and so I, again, I was clueless then. I, I, I thought my intense, you know, best friendship was purely platonic. Yeah. And this, this uh, community theater group was um, run by four openly gay men, um, all but one of which died of AIDS. And oh, at that time, I, and, and, and the, the, the guy who was in charge was um, infected at that point and actually had active AIDS, and I didn't know it. Um, but at some point, 
like I remember when I first got involved with them, I remember making some anti-gay AIDS joke just out of ignorance uh-huh. and not realizing. And like yeah, I remember it was just the other what people did. Yeah, and other right? folks were like looking at me, and then someone was like, uh, "Do you realize like all the people in charge are gay men, and one of them does in fact have AIDS?" And I was like, oh. "Oops!" And I think, "Oh my God, here I am, like." Little Miss, like, lesbian poster child, but in 10th grade, I was as ignorant as they came. Yeah. I was as ignorant as everyone around me, and I think it just shows that that stuff is in the culture. Yeah. It's implicit. It's implicit. It's part it's of, it's all part of around the water you. we're swimming in. It's all around you. Yeah. I think that's right. So you realize, you, you, come to, you sort of come to terms with your, your emerging sexuality. In college. In college. What do you what do you do about it? Um, I I ended up there wasn't a lot going on on campus, so I ended up getting involved with the National Organization for Women now, chapter right. in Chicago. Yeah. There was a big chapter in Chicago, yeah. so I just started showing up to volunteer, and I ended up on the board of directors. You know, as an undergrad, yeah. Yeah. Holy shit. Uh, well, because, you know... I, How'd and that I, happen? Well, I came to realize, uh, you know, soon after volunteering, that there are a lot of folks who come and go, and uh, there are a lot of folks who are not that committed. So when, when someone shows up and they're committed, they, like, grab them. They're like, yeah. okay, you're not flaky. You know, <laughs> we need non-flaky people. Sure. Um, and so that was really great because I was... Just, at that point, I was deciding what I wanted to do with my life, and I'm like, do I want to do activism or do I want to do academia so a lot of the work that I did with Chicago now is was me trying to figure out what I wanted to do uh at that time there was a lot of activism around the abortion issue going on because that was that was right before the big Casey decision so uh I got trained in uh Clinic defense because there. This was a time at which the anti-abortion activists were trying to shut down the clinics, so there was a whole like, you know, all-day training where you learned how to physically protect women, how to link arms, how to you know how to get women in and out of the clinics. So we did a lot of clinic defense. We did a lot of you know policy activism. It was all early nineties. Yeah, around 90, 90, 91. 91, 92. 91, 92. Yeah. Um, and that was amazing. And that was where I met my first um, lesbian lover. Lesbian who lover. Who was 16 years older than, than I was. Yeah. Which well. is not that uncommon, I think. No, the, it's not that uncommon. I mean, she was pretty freaked out about, like, you know, you're, you know, I'm, I'm like, sp- spoiling you. And I'm like, I'm a willing partner. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Because um, you're what? How old are you at that at that point? At that point, I was nineteen. Nineteen. Well, so you start to really experience. Did you? What, how, did you talk to your parents? What happened? I did. Um, it did not go great. It did not go. Great. My mom. Well, my mom was okay mainly because I was crying, yeah. and and she, I think, you know, turned out to sort of be freaking out on the inside, but she did a good job of being like, I love you, you know, I just want you to be happy. My father did not believe me. He thought that it was a political act, and he said, because he was, Cause you're, he was a bit you're, upset you're, that I was like becoming this feminist National Institute, activist. The National Organization yeah, for so Women. Yeah, so he was like, They're you just know, putting you, ideas in you your don't head. have to be a zealot. You know, at yeah. some point he called me a zealot, and I'm like, <laughs> it's not really a zealot thing. So that was... That was not great, but my sister, who I'm so close to, um, was great, and apparently what happened is she sort of sat my parents down, gave them a talking to, and was like, you know what? This is your older sister? Yeah. It was like, whatever you guys are dealing with, she's two and a half years older. Whatever you're dealing with, you need to not burden Lisa with this. Yeah. So go ahead. Go to therapy. Go to PFLAG. Work out what you need to work out. But do not share your bad feelings with her. That's Go ahead. Pretty wise. It is pretty That's wise. wise. So yeah. I was like, afterwards, I'm like, well, I guess you know, I was a little rocky, but everything went okay. And I found out that like they actually were <laughs> they struggling were thrown into quite turmoil. a bit. Well, um, but they kept it to themselves. Yeah, you That's know, what parents parents need to do that sometimes. They need yeah. to work it out by themselves. They need to deal with that. Yeah, they did not like my first lover. Uh, she was really butch, and I think that freaked them out. Yeah, that's a little freaky. For, you know, and for, so I think that was part of it. Was they were like, Wah. 
Um, <laughs> you know, uh-huh. so. And then I went yeah. to, I, when I went to grad school, I met my current wife like right away. Like and, and that was it. That was at Cornell? That was at Cornell. So you went to, so you got your gra- undergraduate degree in psychology. Yeah. What, in 90- oh, and that was, and that was the other thing. So the reason I got it in psychology is because my roommate in college, who I was totally in love with, uh, I was. Oh gonna, yeah, we got it. We we we. Yeah, left that's that how thread. we got we got sidetracked. Yeah. So uh, she, I was going to major in anthropology because the you know Chicago's got amazing yeah, anthropology. I know. So all the courses that I really liked were in anthropology, and then she announced that she was going to major in anthropology, and I thought it would be bad for our friendship if we had the same major. I thought that would make us competitive. So I'm like, okay, then I'll switch to psychology so that we don't oh, have the damn. same major. You're kidding. And that's why I became a psychologist. And then she ended up switching to psychology too. Oh, so all of that was for What not. a pain in the ass. Yeah. So if I had not been in love with her, I might have been an anthropologist. Well, anthropology lost out. Yeah. There you go. So did, and, but you, so and how did, why did you decide? The kind of well, at that time, it wasn't. It wasn't, it wasn't like it, what it is now. It, yeah. Like there were boring classes. Like I'm not even sure. I don't know. It was weird. It just shows how random these things but, are. But, but so, how did you decide to? Did you apply widely to grad school, or did um, you? Was I, I Cornell did figure really out because your... I took a year off between graduation and grad school, so I, I didn't feel panicked yet, and I knew that I needed to find like a topic to study. Yeah. And, you know, because I was a newly out person, I spent a lot of time in the bookstore, like, reading all the books about gay people. Sure. And I discovered a book written by one of the faculty at Chicago, Gilbert Hurt, um, uh, called Children of Horizons. And it was about the uh, adolescent gay youth group in Chicago called the Horizons Project. And that was a time that... The, the gay youth groups did not exist yeah, really it was just not on people's radar that you could be a gay teen so this was a revolutionary kind of book and i was like oh my god like this is what i want to do like this is new it's interesting like i don't see a lot of women in these stories and so that i hooked on that as like okay that's going to be the thing that i apply to graduate school to do i want to do uh stuff on gay youth with a focus on women it sound yeah wow no so that really it. that really lit your fire as yeah they say yeah and so then i you know it was hard because there were only two places that had faculty who were doing gay stuff right this was a time that two places yeah uh, and university of chicago was one of them because gilbert Hurt right, was there right right and Did Rich you, Seven Williams at, at Cornell. Cornell, yeah, and sure. So everywhere else I applied were folks that had stuff doing adolescence, but they didn't have stuff doing like University of Michigan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and 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 it was just basically for me the decision was: Do I want to have to educate my own advisor about? gay stuff, or do I want to go to a place with someone who already kind of knows? Well. The and, landscape and thinking about you know your activism being involved with with now and your sort of activism with regard to your your emerging identity um how did the science fit with that i mean did science seem very know. compatible with that or did you was there well, any I tension so. there? i mean i you know sometimes I, I think that there's tension around those kinds of I, advocacy i grew up in a my you know my father was an academic yeah. He was an academic uh, cardiologist. And starting from when I was like 12 or 13, he would actually give me his journal articles to edit and review, which I didn't. I was like, what? <laughs> I, I didn't even understand he what was journal a, articles he was were. A cardiologist? He was a cardiologist. Um, but, you know, he basically did a whole lot of work on applying. Bayesian statistical methods to the prediction of cardiovascular disease. Shit, that's pretty advanced. It was very advanced. And, you know, it's not just because my father, I'll toot his horn. He sort of revolutionized the field of predictive cardiology. Wow. So, but his papers were really statistical and theoretical, and yeah. I couldn't understand them. Like, why am I them. editing this? Yeah, why am I and I feel this? like I have no idea. I I, can't, I don't know what a receiver operating characteristic is, Dad. I don't I don't, I don't know. I can't read it. <laughs> but he could tell that I had an aptitude for writing and for science, and he wanted to encourage that. So, he wanted me to go into academia. He 
loved that side of me and and that was a part of our connection so I think a part of me wanted to please him and yeah. wanted to be a scientist and when I discovered that there was sort of a field of scientific research on queer people it was like oh that's me I can do I'm both the I can do something that that satisfies the the activist side of me but it can also be grounded in science because this is a legitimately understudied phenomenon yep um and and you know yeah knowledge so is good i think that's knowledge what, is good not that's what knowledge will and help. also you know when you're when you're a smart kid and you go to college you don't really know what to do like i didn't really know what jobs were out there yeah um in the year between graduating and going to grad school I was working at the University of Chicago's um, basically rape crisis center. And wow, you... that was just really kind of frustrating and didn't feel very helpful because there was there was like a gang rape that was not being dealt with very effectively by the administration. So I felt like, wow, I'm not really able to do anything, you know, of value. Like, here I am, this activist, and I'm failing at, you know, a- advocacy and activism. I think I'll go back to the safe world of books and yeah. and deep thoughts uh-huh. um, yeah so you get to cornell do you, do you do you meet judy right away um, i met judy within like 2 weeks holy crap yep that's wow yeah. that settled that I wasted no time good i guess i mean that i don't know and it was interesting at that time people did not go to graduate school to work on gay stuff um, <sighs> it was you know, most not, of them. I mean, it seemed, it would have been very specialized. Well, it was not. Well, not even that. It was just stigmatized. It yeah, wasn't was really. It stigmatized? It's hard to remember now how dangerous it was. And Rich Seven Williams, my advisor, you know, ended up telling me that that when my application came in, he had been about to retire early, because since he had, you know, he was a full professor and he had shifted to doing work on you know queer youth. And basically, people stopped applying to work with him. No graduate students wanted to touch it with a 10-foot Wow. Board. So he was like, well, if this is the way... And he had gotten a re-specialization in clinical, so he had started seeing... You know, he was doing research, but he was also seeing uh, clients. And he was thinking, you know, I, I can think I'll I can just... apply my, my knowledge and skills in a different way. Yeah, and he was like, I think I'm just going to leave the whole academic thing behind and then he said like I was in that thought process and your application came in and I was like wow a graduate student is willing to actually do gay research like wow and so he's like okay I'll try this out a little longer and then he ended up you know he just recently retired so he ended up you know staying and doing like some amazing work over the past 20 years and so I, you sa- I always say to him I'm it. like I saved your career yeah well you saved saved it for all of us because it was just it that. really was uh that uncommon and you know because it was a small niche uh I felt really uh isolated from the other graduate students yeah uh, because i would go to the big conferences like society for research on child development and aps and there wasn't anything uh going on with regard to sexual orientation or or lgbt issues and so i just felt like i'm doing something that no one else cares about and you know when you go to these conferences you see all these hardworking graduate students wearing little suits and carrying their posters and they know exactly who to talk to. They're like already angling for the jobs they're going to get or the postdocs. <laughs> and I just it's felt kind like... Of, it's kind of... It was, it was <laughs> very intimidating and yeah, I just felt like yeah, I'm yeah. not a part of that, that world too. at all because <laughs> the work I'm doing, no one's going to hire. Like, I'm just not a part of this world. And I came close to quitting, you know, several yeah. times because I would go to these conferences and I found it so demoralizing. And I was like, there's no way, there's no way I'm going to succeed at this. Well, you know, it's, you know, it's really funny or maybe not fun. Maybe this isn't funny. Maybe this is, this is more saddish, but I didn't identify. I mean, when I thought about Lisa Diamond and Lisa Diamond's work, I thought about attachment and you know attachment and bonding and attachment and health and so I, mean, I didn't think about sexuality until i'd known you well, for a while what's interesting longer. is that i found that like 
you know, because I started doing the attachment stuff, they're sort of like, I have two sets of colleagues. Some know a lot about the attachment stuff I do uh-huh. and like had no idea about the sexuality stuff. Some know about the sexuality stuff and have no idea about the attachment stuff. So I always felt like I, in some ways I had these like dual sets of colleagues right. that didn't necessarily, you know, uh, interact with each other. But one of the reasons that I, and I, you know, when I got to know Cindy Hazan and started doing the attachment stuff, you know, I, I, I was so passionate about it, but I remember Rich was like, "Well, it's really good that you're that you're interested in this because you need something more mainstream, right? You need something other funny? than the gay stuff. Isn't that so interesting? And I'm glad that you actually are interested in this and that you're not just doing right, it right, right, because right. you need it. But the truth is that you do need it. Well, and there's also a very important way in which we need to understand attachment processes in sexuality, right? Yeah, and, and at that time there still, wasn't there still wasn't a lot little, of cross talk yeah. for that. Well, hardly, um, hardly so when, any exists I, to this day. I believe that I would not have gotten the job at Utah if I had only been doing the gay stuff. I yeah. think it was the fact that I was doing both. Because I was hired in a joint appointment position. I'm a joint appointment with gender studies. So the psychology folks really liked the attachment stuff. The gender studies program really liked the, were the you a, queer did, stuff. Were you, were, you a joint, were you jointly hired right from the beginning? Right from the beginning. The, the position was... A joint appointment. Wow. Um, and that's pretty. I mean, University of Utah. I right? know. Right. You think about going from the f- frying pan into the fire. I was so doubtful, and so was Judy. Um, you know who had? Yeah. Who? You know where's she from? She's actually from uh, Los Angeles as well. Okay. But we met. So you she's, know. Yeah. You meet in Cornell. It was, that's. It was, it, but it's strange. worked out well because it makes the holidays you know, easier. <laughs> um. And she was, she had gotten her master's in history and then decided she didn't want to do academia. So she was still kind of casting about for what she wanted to do. And she's like, Utah? Really? Exactly. Salt Lake City? Exactly. This is, this is, this is our destiny? She was very doubtful yeah, about it. Yeah, I would be too. Um, she had done all this research. She's like, there's only one job there that I can imagine wanting. But she got it. Um, <laughs> That's good. And then yeah. she, her career ended up really taking off, you know, uh-huh. and and so it it ended up being a, a good fit. And I cannot, I literally cannot believe that I've been there uh, for seventeen years. Seventeen years. It, it's like what happened? Yeah. You know, I truly. But it's an amazing place. You know, you talk about like queer migration. Every gay person in the state of Utah, and some of them from Idaho. Come and live in Salt Lake City, because Salt Lake City is is a refuge mm-hmm. in the or sort of a regional refuge. Most regions have one or two yep. of those. You know, Tucson and is sort of and, like and that in Arizona. And we ended up on the list of like one of the top ten gay places to live, like in America. So really, there's a huge queer community there, and it's totally. And of course, working at the university, everybody at the university is from someplace else. Yeah, they're all completely progressive. Yeah, and it's been um, totally awesome to and work there so so where did your where has your research i mean so now when i think of of lisa diamond pr- predominant i mean i i think about your certain attachment papers that i always mm-hmm. cite and talk about with my students you know like you know sort of a regulatory system that attachment brings and bonding creates um but what i really think of these days is is this concept of sexual fluidity Mm-hmm. which was one of the things that really surprised me. I mean, you know, by that time, though, by the time I'm getting surprised by this work, I'm enlightened. You know, I'm fully enlightened about sex. You know, I'm like, like I under- I'm, I'm down good with, with everything. I'm down. My, some of my best friends are the gays, whatever. And then it's like, you know, and then, what are but the wait gays? Wait a minute. What, what, yeah, right, Who exactly. are the gays? Exactly. Then, then uh, you know, the ground under, under even my progressive feet start, start, mm-hmm. starts becoming very uncertain. When I think about the idea that people change, and I and I, and, I, and I started, I mean, I thought I th- I think I sort of responded not negatively at first to that. I mean, because you know I was I'm not a, opposed to this in any way, well, but I but I was sort of surprised for a while. The progressive, what seemed to be the progressive opinion, is like, I know gays are born that way. It's not a choice. Like let's, you know, it's like very sort of ethnic model well of and even among gayness. the people that i knew who Absolutely. were gay all, all my adult life you know that i i've i've often felt that even within the the sort of queer community there's a kind of outsider mm-hmm. status to bisexuality mm-hmm. for example mm-hmm. and, and people have talked about that a little bit i don't really understand it you know at a visceral level but i understand it at 
a conceptual it's, it's one. A, I think a lot of minority communities have a lot of boundary policing that goes on. Yeah. I think it's true for, uh, you know, ethnicity. It's true for religion. There's always a lot of boundary policing. I think that's a part of any marginalized group's coping mechanism. Yeah. Are you in or are you out? And, you know, and, and so I think that's where that sort of came from. But I think some of the fervor around the boundary policing is energized by the very fact that, that those boundaries are permeable. And everyone knows it, and, and, and that's and why it makes it so makes scary. It makes it uncomfortable. Makes it uncomfortable. Anything that's uncomfortable, we just want to you know, make that go away. Yeah. So, so tell me about this sample that, yeah, that, so, that, I mean, that this led you like to the, these conclusions. This was it's just the like the most sample. the most terrible, terribly organized um, master's thesis project in the God, history. It goes of, back to your masters. Yeah, yeah. So I basically, that? I land at Cornell, and Rich didn't have any existing samples. That or you know most graduate students go and they and they, their advisor has a research project that they start working yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Rich, you know, didn't you yeah, know because whoops. he was thinking about leaving it. You right. know, so he didn't have any data for me to work with. And he's like, "Well, what are you? you know, what do you want to do?" And I'm like, "Well, you know, all of these studies of sexual identity development are on men, and and largely it was because samples were recruited by just going to like community groups, right? And you know those." those groups always drew more men than women. That's so interesting. And so I, I only found I like one study that had any women in it, and it was like 10 women or something. <laughs> and I was like, wow, okay, I'm supposed to find a topic that no one's doing. And like, my, that will be my thing. Like, where are women's voices? Where are women's experiences? Yeah. I was like, Rich, I just want to interview a bunch of women and like see what, you know, what their process of identity development is. And he was like, okay. <laughs> um, and I've, <laughs> I've it, joked with him like, huh? since then. I've been like, okay. how could you let me do this crazy project? Like, where, you know, why weren't you forcing me to have, like, more clear... Co- and he's like, well, I think you did okay. Yeah. So, like, obviously, <laughs> it was not such a disaster. Uh, um, but uh, I really... I He's going to love that characterization. I did not have it. a lot of clear ideas about what I wanted to do. Um I just knew I wanted to interview women and just sort of, you know, get... But how did you... So you just came up with your own line of questioning, you know, like, yeah. like oral history interviews or yeah, what? Yeah, yeah. I just looked at the, did, was, I, I looked at the very small literature. Were they all open-ended they were, questions? They were, oh, no, I had... You know, they were, yeah, they were pretty open-ended. You did questions. I had questions. You I did, had, did you do like, like attachment scales and things no, like that? No, because that, nothing, I started the project before even I that. discovered oh, attachment theory. Oh, got it. Okay. Like I didn't, yeah. you know... Yeah. And so basically... I just wanted to know the the process through which women start to question their sexuality. And, and you again, you was, had to f- seek out I had to find the women women who identified at well, time one. I didn't I didn't as, want them to necessarily lesbian? identify. I just said they just have to have some form of same sex attraction. So, I didn't so require that's them to identify. Open-ended. So basically, and the internet didn't exist. So I was like, how am I going to find these women? And Rich was like, well, they're they're pretty big, you know, communities in like Syracuse and Rochester. So, and I didn't have a car. So I bought a used car for $5,000. Wow. Um, a, a 1989 Toyota Corolla that I still have. Stop that it. still I'll runs. cut it out. Oh. What are you talking about? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, we call it the Firebird <laughs> because it's actually been on fire, <laughs> but it's still running. Uh, and basically, I, every good. single weekend, <laughs> I would drive to Syracuse or Rochester or Binghamton or Elmira or Freeville, and I would go to places that had coffee shops, um, anything where there were, you know, gay community where I thought young women might be, and I would just physically walk up to people and be like, Are you I'm doing me? a study about... You just um, ask them about their sexuality? Yeah. I was like, I'm doing this interview study. I had no money. Yeah. I that's was a lot like, of legwork. I'm doing work. this interview study, you that's know... Not, that's and, not uh, messing around. And Judy and I, you know, because we were a new couple, so she would actually sometimes come with me to recruit people, and she was way better at it than I was. She, she has no fear. She'd just walk up to people, <laughs> and, and she'd be like, I found you like five more. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> angrily uh, and so then i would you. schedule the interviews and then i would kind of drive back and do like 10 interviews in a day you know in a, in a particular location wow. and just drive back and forth drive back and forth drive back and forth drive back and forth oh my god uh, and Lisa, it was as it was a grad student like and you're taking classes ground. and you're you know eating 
you know, eating top ramen. rice and top ramen. I remember the eating a lot of um, sweet potatoes because sweet I could potatoes, eat them they're nutritious, while I right? was driving, and I could munch them in one hand while driving the. Car. You could munch. What you didn't cook them? You no, know, I cooked them in the microwave, but then I would eat them like an apple. Really? You know? Yeah. Holy just, crap. Just nuke them and then wrap that's, them in tinfoil. That's a little crazy. Well, I'm, I, you know, I would say that's a little, that qualifies, that crosses it was a good, over the it was line. It's a good portable food. Into crazy a little bit. It's a good bit. portable food. Yeah, I guess that's true. So, it, you know, so I, I did the interviews and I knew I wanted to follow folks over time, but I didn't really have a clear plan on that. And so, you know, it just sort of emerged spontaneously, but I, I, just recently have been doing the 20 year follow up interviews 20 years 20 year. years that's amazing and what's hilarious and people from are like this, how from did this you? little because and i only you know, lost you think, but i got i just have to process this for a second can i do that for i just mm -hmm. have to pro because when i think about a, a 20 year longitudinal study i think of a multi center nih I know. you know gigantic fucking you know but it's a small you know, number of women millions of dollars with multiple you know pis and you know and and you're talking about a, a one person no money no funding and I think the reason that I haven't lost folks is because it's always me. Yeah. I never had anybody else do the They interviews. know you. They know me. They and trust what's, you. What's been sort of gratifying over the years is, you know, because I was a grad student when I started. I was close in age to a lot of the participants. And so when I, when I call them, you know, every couple of years, they're like, so what's going on with you? So you have a job. Like, you're at Utah. <laughs> I saw you on the, the web. Like, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> you know, so the pa there's not a big power imbalance, yeah. I think, the way there is, because I was young and naive when I started it. And so they feel proud of me. And when they're I when I published the book, I sent them all a copy of the book. Oh, that's nice. They're and like your collaborators, in a way. Exactly. I mean, they're, exactly. They're, all they have to do is be honest. Yeah. And so, so at what point do you realize that people are not being consistent in their reporting? Well, when I asked women to talk about some of their earliest attractions, a lot of them were describing these really passionate friendships similar to the one that I had in high school uh -huh. with, my, with my best friend. And I would be like, well, you know, were you attracted to her? And they'd be like, no, I, I really wasn't. And I was like, wow, that because, you know, similarly, because I, I wasn't really aware of feeling like, erotically attracted to my best friend in high school it was the you, one in you were, college you were just that, drawn it was like we were them. really like we were in a romantic relationship with one another yeah and and adolescence is so intense anyway yeah. so it would be easy to and so not that know was exactly that was the on. first thing that struck me was that there was something that we we were all assuming that those romantic feelings always co-occurred with sexual feelings and it was clear to me from the interviews that that wasn't the case and that's why i sought out cindy hazan because I was like trying to understand this. And she introduced me to attachment theory. And I started doing all this reading. I'm like, oh, they're attachment bonds. They're just not sexual attachments. Right. They're more analogous to parental attachment right, bonds. Right. And so she introduced me to sort of a framework that helped me make sense of the fact that there were these romantic relationships between women that had all of the signature features of romantic attachments, the uh, uh, obsessive proximity seeking, the separation distress, the safe haven, they just weren't sexual. Uh, and it was, you know, maybe a developmental thing. And that was, you know, the big sort of aha moment. Well, and also you're catching these, these young women basically still as adolescents. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so... And the so, age range was 16 to 23. Right? So so adolescence is a time, I mean, you know, in, in attachment terms where you're where you're really your world is turning upside down because and those you're, systems you're sort of haven't cutting those gotten early attachments. integrated yet. Yeah, right. you're in this transitional thing where you you have to rebuild you have a social to rebuild set it. of attachments and and that's terrifying. And right? for you most, need to latch and on. And for most adolescents, their first full-fledged attachment figure that's not their parent is a romantic partner sure. but these girls had sort of figured out a sort of transition that their first romant their first attachment figure other than a parent was their best friend and, do you and it just wasn't a sexual relationship that, i mean i think about eleanor maccabee's stuff uh, uh, about how girls same-sex friendships same -sex friendships how yeah. they they're 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 sort of nicer yeah for, for girls they're safe uh, for girls especially right because boys are kind of a pain in the ass i mean that you know i mean i don't yeah. want to be too generalizing boys have their own 
I think version of this. Yeah. But the but the 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 enculturation and the way the way things go, they're not oriented towards and they don't that get sort of they don't get the same sort behavior. of cultural permission. They don't. That's right. So they have their own issue there. So you know, so I ended up designing my dissertation around female friendships to try to sort of you know that was make very that, ahead of its time. But it was Holy a total shit. failure. It was like the worst dissertation ever, <laughs> and nothing ever got published from it. And it was yeah. like a complete yeah, bust. That's how that happens. Sometimes. You know, and but so it's odd. It's like the work that I ended up publishing more and getting more known for was my master's thesis research yeah and the dissertation just sort of you know died I, you know i published my master's thesis and i never ever ever published would never publish my shitty dissertation and i always tell that to graduate students to sort of reassure them i'm like it's just another study yeah it's not going to be the last study you do so yeah. don't try and make it your be all and yeah. all yeah. you know it may not you know work out but it was the dissertation that got me into psychophysiology because I, I was using uh, really bad psychophys methods to try and, and sort of test the difference between romantic relationships and best friendships. So then when I get hired at Utah, that's a good, that's a good idea. They're though. like, Oh, well you're, you're, you're you know, you want to set up a psychophys lab. And yet I had never been trained in it. Like we didn't, the, the psychophys measures that Cindy Hazan was using were basically the heart rate monitors that runners buy. <laughs> it, it was it was just heart rate. There and was nothing they weren't, else. They weren't so great then. No, they weren't. So, and so I didn't know. I mean, and it was my dad who was like, you know, you really need separate measures of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Yep. I'm like, oh, and I was like, wow, I'm like trying to get into this field, and yet I'm not being trained by people who know anything about it. So when I landed at Utah, it was just luck because. Tim Smith was there, Bertuccino uh, was there, uh, and you know, and they're like, "You're going to benefit a lot from being here." And they just supported me completely. I had to set up the psychophys lab, having never actually collected valid psychophys data ever. So I just hit the books and was completely 100% self-taught on on everything because I never had any training in it. And at what, all. what kind of stuff do you start finding? Um, my right away, I mean, I was very, I became really interested in the emerging research on emotion regulation and the uh -huh. parasympathetic nervous system, the whole porges and, yeah. and vagal, vagal tone. Stuff. And so I quickly was like, wait, this, this all suggests that attachment security should be related to, you know, vagal tone. And, and I, I couldn't understand why I couldn't find any research on attachment theory and psychophysiology other than like one chapter that was on like kids getting, you know, in the strange situation. And that was, you know, what I really wanted to do. So I ended up writing a review paper on, I'm like, wow, either, either I'm, you know, you know, is it, is it possible that I'm the first person who's seeing why this is relevant? And it turned out that that was sort of true. Like yeah. no one was doing it in adults. There was stuff yeah, on yeah, yeah. kids. Right. So I wrote this uh, review paper that basically was a way to sort of force myself to really articulate, okay, like where, where am I going with this? Like, it, you know, if I'm going to commit to this, like I need to make sure I'm not going down a rabbit hole. So a part of it was just me boning up on it. And, but that sort of served as the framework for what I ended up doing, which was looking for associations between vagal tone and vagal withdrawal and attachment uh, and would you, what, what, what was the bottom line there? I mean, is it vagal? So does attachment security increase parasympathetic tone? That well, sort of thing? yeah. So individuals who are insecurely or is it go the attached, other way? who are individuals who are insecurely attached have lower vagal tone, which is exactly what you would expect yeah. if attachment insecurity creates some is a sort of problems. is some form of regulatory deficit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that was true, and yeah. so you know that was the the first thing I found, and then since then I've I've I found other manifestations of that in, in other ways in terms of looking at couples and looking at how individuals who have low, lower vagal tone have different sorts of reactions to their partner's negative affect uh -huh. and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but all of that was on like heterosexual couples. So right. I was still doing the gay yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. and I was doing this attachment stuff. I basically had two different careers yep. going on yep. and two different sets of colleagues. But because I had a joint appointment in gender studies, it was okay and uh my biggest insecurity early on at utah was that someone was going to say to me at some point either you're a qualitative sexuality researcher or you're a quantitative psychophysiologist who does attachment like pick one right pick 
pick a direction because right now you're all over the map. But to me, they were always deeply Wait, connected. Wait, someone, someone did say that? No, to, no, that was no, my fear. That was your fear. That was my yeah, fear. That, yeah, that, that doesn't seem to have happened. And I, I mean, no. I really... And I remember when I was writing my third year statement before my third year review, really trying to like articulate why these were both actually what, connected. Figure out what the nexus is. Yeah. And I think from that, a, lot, a big part of that was the psych review piece on, you know, on, on the links between attachment and sexuality. Yeah, great, but that for me stuff. was like, I, I needed shit. to publish that to show that these were not two different lines of research. Yeah. They were actually connected if I could just, you know, explain how they were connected. Well, and, and you know, there's, there's sort of a meta scientific aspect to this too, because by the time you're doing the, the, the psychophys attachment stuff, there's a big giant literature on attachment and a big giant literature on psychophysiology and, and you know, me- measuring parasympathetic tone and what it's associated with in terms of self-regulatory cap- capabilities and on and on. But there's not that much. There's not that much about, about sexuality yeah. and sexual identity formation, all that stuff. And, and one of the things that, I mean, even Popper wrote about was that you have to develop the hypotheses? Bridge. You got to you got to figure out what you well, what, what to look at. I was always shocked by the fact that because I always would attend the IARR meetings, the International Association of Relationship Research, and every year, other year they would be international, and I would always attend the International Academy of Sex Research, yeah. and they also alternated. And I I was I was always shocked by the fact that I was the only person who was at both meetings. I'm like, don't the relationships people? Uh. Want to know about sexuality? God, it's and still don't such the a sexuality problem. people want to know about relationships? Uh, and I kept geez. thinking, oh, I'm sure next year I'll see some of the same people. I'm like, no, no. Like, what's going I mean, the fields were very segregated. And I think a part of it is a sort of um, uh, a squeamishness about is sexuality it better now? among the relationship is it better? researchers. Has it gotten Not better? Not that much Not better. Not that much better, really. I mean, I gave a talk at the IARR meeting um, in Israel called Where's the Sex in Relationship Research. Yeah. Um, And, you know, I I was saying to folks, you know, we have these 36-item measures of conflict. Yeah. And then the measure of sexual satisfaction will be like, are you satisfied? Yeah. Okay. All right. That's all we need to know. And I'm like, um, no. And forget psychophys. You know, there's no, there's, you know, applied to sexuality. Oh, Nothing man. about There's, like what you do, yeah. how you negotiate, you know, your sexual practices. But see, that's what I'm saying. That's why you need to have these more open-ended qualitative approaches because yeah. you, you're, you're gathering clues as to where to, where to look more quantitatively, mm-hmm. systematically mm-hmm. down the mm-hmm. road. You really need to build that foundation. And but So, so I want to pivot a little bit because I really want to get back to what sexual fluidity is. Mm-hmm. What did you discover it is? And, and it sounds like... You've been using the attachment framework to explain it a little bit, but I want yeah. to know just what so is it? So the way I would describe it and sort of what sort of happened as I started doing follow-up interviews around every two years with my respondents was I would find that their sexual identity labels kept changing, and I found that a lot of them were engaging in relationships that didn't match their pattern of attraction. So some of the women who were like, oh, I'm... 95% attracted to women. Then I talked to them two years later. They're like, well, I started sleeping with my male best friend. And I'd be like, well, okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty what's, big change. Uh, what's what the going, on going on there? And it was clear from talking to them that it wasn't like they were going back in the closet or they were repressed. They were, all my respondents were really open and like, you know, you know they were not deluded or repressed. So that standard explanation of, oh, you're just going back into the closet or you're, it's false consciousness. You Drawing don't know what you want. Yeah. Sort of process. Instead, they were like, well, this relationship just really kind of blew my mind. And so again, I was really drawn to, the, to this notion of attachment that there is something about specific relationships that can be so compelling that it draws women into erotic feelings that they didn't have before. In, um, in for for either for either gender. direction, yeah. Because I also was talking to women who I was interviewing who were like, "I'm I think I'm pretty heterosexual, but I just started sleeping with my female best friend, and I don't know where that came from." And then I would talk <laughs> to them two years later, and they'd be like, "Yeah, I'm back with men," and I'd be like, "So were you deluded? Were you?" And they'd be like, "I don't know. It was just that, that was one a woman. thing that happened. That was a thing that happened, and I did it. Was it. a thing that and, happened. Now, and did so, you did you was there like 
confusion or shame I was, or I was I mean, totally con- I mean yeah I mean, in I them think but for them there was a lot of confusion a lot of shame I think especially for the women who had been identified as lesbian who started relationships with men the lesbian community was like get out you know so ah. some of them have, so coming from all directions yeah yeah and I think that's changed a lot since then but at that time it, it it was really fraught for for a lot of these individuals, which was part of what, you know, as I started to do the research, became really compelling to me because invariably the women who had those sorts of experiences felt that they were the only one. They were like, one woman actually said to me, I feel like I'm a bad example of a lesbian, so if you don't want to continue interviewing me, that's fine because I don't want to, I don't want to mess up your study. Uh, and I was like, oh my God, you don't this realize is my study. Yeah. I'm like, you don't realize how common you actually are. Yeah. And so that was something that struck me right away was that all of them seemed to think they were the only one yeah. having this sort of more fluid experience. And that, I was like, oh my God, I think our whole, our whole model of what's normal and what's exceptional is reversed. Because because the the fluidity was the norm. Yeah. Right. I mean, it was relatively rare that people were that people all were in really, one really direction consistent. or all in the other. And so I was like, oh my god, we've got this completely wrong. That's like, fucking. Completely that's amazing. Upside down. Do you know that that's early amazing? Early on, the thing is, early on, you know, when I was publishing the first, you know, from the first couple rounds of of follow up data. People were like, well, you know, you've got this weird sample and it's a small sample. And I was like, I, I totally get that. And they're like, you know what, I, I, you may be on to something, but it's probably not that big of a phenomenon as your sample is making it seem like. Right. You've got a weird sample. It's, it's, what, and so now I feel women? so validated because now we have these unbelievable representative studies, the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health, uh, studies, longitudinal studies from New Zealand, and they've all shown the same thing and i'm like i was right it wasn't just my tiny like my you're tiny right i had this sample tiny Cornell, sample but i was not wrong about the phenomenon yeah. and now i feel so now when i give talks i present all the big data because i'm like see i wasn't crazy I yeah was not right because especially in the current climate it's a little bit nerve-wracking you know to to but you know your sample wasn't that small well, it was, it was what, over a hundred. I started 100 with a hundred with, with, with you know a decade of well, you know, like two that decades is a small, now. and it's like you know completely snowball sample. So I mean, sure. I totally get that, but you know, I also feel that um, there is a role for small sample research, and I feel oh, like comple- ab- that absolutely. my study is, yeah. a, is an example of the fact that you need that sort of work for hypothesis generation. Yes. And you need That's it right. to be able to figure out what questions to ask. So certainly, I, I never expected it to be the last word on anything. But you, the only way to get some some of the information that we need is through that more intensive small sample work. Yeah, and you know that that has no funding and that is cheap to do <laughs> and that you know you just kind of well. pull it out of your your you know out of your hat. And it, and and is there any evidence that there are sex differences? In this, in, I mean, is well, this initially, I really thought there were. Initially, I was like, "This is like a female phenomenon," but I think largely, I'm starting to to doubt that because I've started collecting data from men, and they're showing some of the same kind of variability that I used to think was more common in women. So, I, I, I kind of feel like the jury's out on that. I yeah. used to think that women were the way more fluid than men. The common story is that women are are more. Yeah. And I was you know, a part of that conversation. I was yeah. a part of. I was one of the people, pro, you know, right. making that argument. And that, that men, and there's more of a genetic uh, and component. It, and it might in be. Males. It might be that there is, you know, more fluidity in women than men. But I think the size of that gender difference is is an open empirical question. Yeah. That's just amazing stuff. I mean, women have had more cultural permission to dabble in same sex yep. sexuality than men yep. have. Um, and so that gives them more opportunities to sort of figure out. But what about the hor- historical record? I mean, I, you know, I've heard, for example, of you know ancient Greek culture being the opposite. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I don't know whether the, there's anything. I don't know what. I mean, I have no, I literally no idea what the evidence is for any of those. Well, I, I think a lot of that just shows like that sexuality, the Iliad or something. I mean, other cultures. You know, it's only the contemporary West that has linked same sex behavior and attraction rigidly to an idea of a fixed orientation yeah you know you find same-sex sexuality in every culture that you look at but it it coexists with 
normal heterosexual uh -huh. behavior. And so it's only relatively recently that we think about it as a trait of a person. Right. And so how they explain it is kind of up to every culture. Is it just men being horny? Is it a form of male friendship, which was true in a lot of cultures? So you find different versions of it, you know, across history and across different cultures. And, you know, in some cultures, for example, the penetrating male, the active partner, is not considered gay. You know, it's only the passive partner who is considered gay. So mm. it's like, yeah, you can engage in as much same-sex behavior as you want. As long as you are the penetrator, that's a totally heterosexual male role. Well, and there's, there's it seems to me that there's also ample space for other sort of sexual behaviors that are not, you know, fully penetration, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I remember reading one, one, of the, one of the surprising things I read. And of course, read, Bill read, Clinton would say they're not sex, so, you know. <laughs> I remember reading uh, uh, Christopher Hitchens' autobiography. Do you know what I'm yeah, referring to? Yeah, and, and, I mean, Christopher Hitchens is this sort of like chest-pounding neocon yeah. guy. And he, and he, there's all kinds of stuff in there about, mm -hmm. about engaging in sexual behavior with, uh, with boys, um, all through his adolescence and, and describing that this was utterly normative, mm -hmm. at least in his recollection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was not, this was and not a lot a, of folks think we were like, oh, the, the boarding school, yeah. circle jerks and yeah, stuff right, like that. Right. You know, so I think that, that there's a lot of space for individuals to interpret attractions and behaviors in a lot of different ways, depending on the context. Yeah. And, uh, we are relatively unique as a culture in that we take any sign of, of same-sex sexuality and we say, that must be an indicator of something permanent about you. Yeah. And the truth is that sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. And maybe the truth is that often it isn't. Yeah. Often it's yeah. just, but, but you know... I, sexuality is uh, a pretty uh, flexible system. Think about, I mean, the people, you always hear about people being like, well, I can't reach orgasm unless I think about some particular thing. And it'll be something kind of crazy. And we're like, wow, obviously, sexuality is a pretty flexible system. You know, that, that you've learned something at some point that gets integrated into your mind. Yeah. And, you know, so clearly cognition and exposure play a role in helping to set sexual trajectories yeah so why are we so surprised you know by that amount of fluidity it's like clearly we're we're not you know like the animals that literally cannot mate unless right. they are you know ovulating right we are a no pretty that's complicated the, species. If, you, if you i was saying to to someone maybe eli uh, a little while ago that um you know if you look if you look f if you try to find real unequivocal generalizations about human behavior it's just really fucking hard to do you can't the rule for humans is flexibility yeah and, because and that's, that's what's adaptive because of our large exactly. brains that's and because we, we lived in diverse did. environments we, we created this capability over phylogeny to uh, flexibly adapt to all kinds of conditions yeah. and that yeah. means that you know not only sexuality but but brought mating strat you know like monogamy you know all of these other things that we sort of on one camp or another, we want to say is is a and fixed it's, it's trait. It's also true with um, stress sensitivity, which I think is so interesting that all this research showing that exposure to early adversity um, can render children sort of set their the development of their stress response systems to be uh, hypersensitive. And that hypersensitivity is adaptive, right? Because if you are living in a dangerous environment, you need to be hypervigilant. Yeah. Uh, and that hypervigilance actually makes them more sort of absorbent of good environments as well yeah. as bad. Yeah, yeah. So we as a species have evolved mechanisms to take in what kind of environment am I in? And, to, and, the, and the body changes. It's not just a, you know, a behavioral change. There are physiological changes that yeah. occur, and that's what I find, you know, so fascinating. I guess one, I, I have really one more thing I really wanted to, to ask you, which is given this almost dizzying array of flexibility, fluidity, of dis difficulty typologizing yeah. individuals, where does that leave us politically? And, well, it's and interesting. That's part of what I'm going to talk about. You know, I, I think that the gay community has made a huge mistake in using the fixedness of sexual orientation as the grounds for civil rights by saying, we're born this way, so it's not our Whoa. fault, and please love and accept us. 
um, that first of all is just scientifically wrong. There Whoa. are definitely biological contributions, but they're not deterministic. Right. The like anything of, that, that I know. It's influence. like any 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 geneticist is like that's a stupid thing to say about anything. <laughs> but it's again, it's like the way science gets popularized. Right. Um, for political so, reasons. For political reasons. So A, it's it's just wrong. And there's enough data on change now to show that it's just completely whacked. B, it's actually You're gonna catch not, hell for that. You know, I don't that that's the point. Like I feel like at this point in my career I need to like I always joke with my partner. I'm like I've you know, I've I've job security, I'm like I need to use my power for good and not <laughs> evil. So if, if anyone's gonna catch hell for it, I'm safe. Go ahead yeah, and throw it. Good. So good. B it's, it's so A it's wrong. B it's actually unnecessary. I partnered up with a an a brilliant colleague of mine in the law school at the University of Utah, Cliff Roski, who does work on sort of LGBT legal stuff. Uh -huh. And if you actually look at the decisions, the immutability of sexual orientation has not actually been a factor right. in all the legal victories. We, we think it is, but it, it's actually not. Um, so we, we think that it's helping us, and it's, it actually hasn't been that important because the, there are so many other grounds on which those decisions have been made, and it wasn't a factor in the, in the most recent what is? Supreme Court victory. Usually it's, it's the fact that animus against any particular group is not constitutional. So if, if you know, regardless of whether it's immutable or not, if a law appears to be it's just motivated wrong. by animus, it's just wrong. It's just just wrong. Just, just, and that was the basis for the Lawrence versus Kansas very decision. very good Point. Also, uh, laws against LGBT discrimination are often founded on the sex discrimination yeah. history. That yeah. it ends up being a form of sex discrimination yeah. to to discriminate against like same sex marriage. Immutability, and in terms of the equal protection statutes, um, immutability is one of the list of things that folks can cons that the Supreme Court can consider in in whether or not a law is constitutional. But it's not the only one. Yeah. History of discrimination is another one. Um, so, so it's, again, it's like, it hasn't been, you know, it's, it's one of several things that can be considered. Right. Another is that courts have changed their definition of immutability from a trait that cannot change to a trait that is so central to a person's sense of self that it would be wrong to make them change it. Yeah. So even the definition of immutability from the court's perspective is not what most of us think it is. Yeah. So for all these reasons, We've just been on the wrong road. And then the final thing, which is, which, you know, for me is the most important take home message is that it is simply unjust to the, you know, the entirety of the queer community to make the fixedness of your uh, sexual, same sex sexuality a condition for your rights. Yeah. Because it marginalizes bisexual individuals. And it'll wind up doing it marginalizes more damage again. the kind of women in my study who had one same-sex relationship that there shouldn't be some litmus test for rights where it's like, well, if you're a stable lesbian, you're allowed to be protected by the laws. But if you're someone who had just one same-sex relationship, confused, you don't deserve yeah, your rights. It sets right. up a hierarchy of, you know, queerness. And, you know, there was basically... Any civil rights strategy needs to protect the entire population. Yeah. And so this notion that fixed patterns of sexual orientation are worthy of respect and others are not, it's just antithetical to any sort of movement for self-respect. So that the correct answer to like, oh, you know, are people born this way or are they not? That's an interesting scientific question. Like it's one of my sure. interesting scientific questions, but it has no role in public policy debates. <laughs> it's like a so what? It's like it doesn't matter Amen. how you Amen got to, that. to be. The, either we're a society that protects the privacy of individuals to determine their intimate lives or we're not. No one ever asked during Loving versus Virginia, are some people born like attracted to people of the other race. Right. No right. one no one cares right. why you want to marry the question is, someone of is another this, race. Is this do you have the right to, to make your own marriage choice or, or do you not? not? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. We don't yeah. care why, like, are some people born loving black people? I mean like that that would be a ridiculous <laughs> question. No one would ever think to ask yeah. that question. These people want, are in love now. Yeah. Is the only question. How you got there is a, is an interesting scientific question, but it absolutely should have no role in the public policy debate at all. And so I feel like part of my mission now is to try and make that point because I'm so tired of, of seeing the science be bastardized. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. I, even on the, 
the uh, the website for the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is like this famously progressive. Yeah, sure. They're like, if homosexuality is genetic, as most scientists believe it is, then, you know, discrimination again. And I'm like, okay, that, that statement, if homosexuality is genetic, as most scientists believe, I'm like, do you even understand how heritability, you know, works? works? And yes, there's a there's a genetic contribution, but the heritability of sexual orientation is actually lower than the heritability of smoking, and it's lower than the heritability of job satisfaction. Okay, both of those things surprise me a lot. And you will not open su- up I'm any magazine and, be, and, and see a picture here. of a baby and say, um, "Is this child born unsatisfied with their job?" You know, <laughs> the heritability of sexual orientation is around thirty five percent. Wow. So, yes, it, that is significantly greater than zero. That is a statistically significant, you know, contribution. But it's obviously not deterministic. And and we can't make that a precondition. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Lisa, it's so great to talk to you. Thank you for doing this with this me. Was fun. Was it fun? Yeah. Oh, good. All right. I look forward to hearing the rest of you. <laughs> Thanks. I want to hear Eli's. Yeah, yeah I'll play it for you. Okay. Fun. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's all I got. Thanks to Lisa Diamond for being so forthcoming and candid. I could have done that. I could I could have kept going for a for a lot longer, but I but I didn't want to push my luck. Uh, and I and I hope in any case that that Lisa enjoyed it as much as I did, and and, and hopefully as much as you did. Folks, uh, the music on Circle of Willis is written by Tom Stouffer and Gene Rooley and, and performed by their band, The New Drakes. For information about how to purchase their music, check out the, the About page at circleofwillispodcast.com. Don't forget that Circle of Willis is brought to you by VQR and the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia, and that the, the Circle of Willis is a member of the TEJ FM network. Uh, you can find out more about uh, them, that network, those guys, at teej.fm. And uh, and it, you know, let me say, if you you know, if you like this podcast, why not give us a little review at at iTunes and let us know how we're doing? It's easy. That's yeah, just do that. I'll see you all again at at episode four, uh, where I talk with Will Cunningham of the University of Toronto about. Uh, about becoming one of the world's preeminent neuroscientists and about about the aesthetics of data analysis, believe it or not, among many other things. Until that time, I'll, I'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.